Welcome to Timeless with Vivek Nitur. Our guest today is Professor S. D. Agashe. Professor Agashe was a professor at the Department of Electrical Engineering at IIT Bombay. His research interests include control theory, network theory, speech, analysis, and synthesis. He is also very deeply interested in and has taught courses in areas such as philosophy of science, logic, and foundations of mathematics. Professor Agashe earned a BE in Electrical Engineering from the University of Bombay in 1961 and an MS and PhD in Electrical Engineering from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign in 1963 and 1967 respectively. I have been a student of Professor Agashe at IIT Bombay and I'm hence very excited about him being our guest today. Welcome sir, how have you been? Thank you, Vivek. Uh, it's good to see you and talk to you after a long time. I'm doing pretty well. I hope you are safe in Bangalore. Absolutely, sir. Going to my first question, sir. Uh, what was your childhood like? And what were the key influences on you at that stage of your life? Well, I started my school in uh, Bombay or Mumbai. and. Uh, had a pre pretty good time at school. I was doing well uh, at the uh, matriculation exam. I did pretty well too. And uh, my parents uh, were both uh, professors. So uh, if I had any difficulty, of course, uh, they would be there to answer it. Then uh, after school, I went to St. Xavier's College for two years, finished my intermediate science, and then switched to engineering at the uh, VJTI in Mumbai and had a three-year course in uh, electrical engineering uh, and I graduated in 1961. Then I had a one-year stint at IIT Bombay. I joined the MTech program, but I was tempted to uh, go to the USA in 1962 uh, because I received a fellowship there. And then I, so I went there, did my MS and subsequently the PhD and returned to India in 1967. Uh, there was a job offer from IIT, the Indian Institute of Technology at Kanpur. IIT Bombay was not perhaps as well known uh, for being an American style institute. So that's the reason I chose uh, IIT Kanpur and spent six years there. And in 73, I came back to Mumbai and joined IIT Bombay uh, where I stayed till my retirement. So I have had a smooth uh, sailing as far as the academic uh, life is concerned. Uh, there was no difficulty of any kind in uh, the learning process as such. I was doing pretty well at all the stages. Sir, I'm very surprised to learn that uh, your association with IIT Bombay uh, goes back to the 1960s because I assume that uh, your association started in 1973 when you joined the faculty in the Department of Electrical Engineering. But I'm very surprised to know that uh, you know you were uh, uh, you know you were an MTech student uh, for a year uh, in the early 60s. So, yes. yes. So, so that would have been at a very early stage of the institute. So yes, the IIT Bombay started its BTech program in 1958, the same time that I joined my engineering college. And right. at that time, the IIT B.Tech was a four years duration, right. whereas the uh, degree at uh, University of Bombay uh, was of three years duration. Secondly, right. IIT Bombay was a very new thing at that time. Right. And so that's why, uh, although I could have got admission into IIT Bombay right away, I right. chose uh, not to. But then in 1961, after I finished my bachelor's degree, uh, of course, I was uh, inclined to join the IIT for the MTech program. So right. that's how that happened. And right. so I got back only in 1973. I understand. So so your association with IIT Bombay has been with uh, for almost six decades and not five decades as I thought it was. So this is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yes. 1961 onwards. So I have seen yes. changes on the campus from yes. 1961 till to date, let's say. Right. right. Yep. I, I would ask you more details on that. Uh, a little later, sir. Sir, I did my schooling under Maharashtra State Board and have studied a mathematics textbook written by your respected father. 
could you please tell our viewers about your father and also give us some biographic information about him and his interests well my father was a professor of mathematics at st xavier's college in uh, mumbai and uh, he had a fairly difficult time uh, in his childhood and uh, school days uh, coming from a poor family but he did well too and so he was able after finishing his bachelor's degree in uh, mathematics or arts bachelor of arts as it was called at that time uh, he went to the university of cambridge in england and stayed there for 3 years and completed his master's degree or ma cantab as it, it used to be labeled and then returned to india and this was around 1940 late 1940s uh, Uh, i was not born or i don't was too small even if i was so then he joined what is called a, uh, the there was a dufferin uh, sailing ship which was a training ship for the navy right. so he started his career there teaching at dufferin right. then he got uh, a posting at the elphins elphinstan college for some right. time before right. finally getting to st xavier's college Right. and there he stayed uh, till his retirement after retirement he had stints at two other colleges for shorter periods of time so he he was a professor of mathematics taught at the uh, undergraduate uh, or bachelor's level as well as at the graduate or the postgraduate level at the university of uh, bombay so uh, and like me uh, or maybe like him i should say the other way Uh, he had a good collection of mathematics books which i have inherited of course so uh, and if i had any difficulty at home uh, he would uh, be able to answer it as far as the mathematics goes my mother also was a professor of education and mathematics was also one of her subjects in addition to experimental psychology so both of them uh, were of great help if uh, at any time that it was required and father uh, wrote his first book uh, with his uh, professor uh, professor g s divan uh, here is what the book uh, looks like uh, this was a book on differential equations uh, and this was one of the earliest of the books by any indian author it was subsequently reprinted came out in a cheap edition and so on so the first edition as it as i look at look at it says it was published in 1941 uh, that was when he was back and uh, but he thanks to his uh, professor g s divan he was able to you know they were able to produce a pretty good book we have a few copies of it in our iit library of course i have several copies of my own and uh, so that's how his writing started but then there was a gap eventually then he wrote books on other subjects in mathematics Uh, for example uh, there is a book that he wrote with professor gurjar which is titled vector methods right so then uh, subsequently a book on vector calculus also and then the books that you may use probably uh, it was called yes. mathematics for standard 11 and then mathematics for standard 12 so these yes. are the two books uh, that uh, he wrote right. he also had uh, co-authored uh, he was the principal author a uh, books on calculus uh, at that time there were no separate books differential and integral calculus so he had a book on uh, calculus also so he was quite uh, good at uh, writing uh, textbooks which uh, were quite popular and uh, he would do the proof reading himself sometimes i would help him because i enjoyed doing it and uh, So unfortunately or somehow i was not able to follow in his footsteps so my book output is almost zero except one book which i uh, which was a collection uh, titled science technology and social change a book of readings this right. was published by the university of mumbai in 1980 for what right. is called a foundation course which right. was a course compulsory for all students studying for their bachelor's degree whether arts right. or commerce or science they had right. to have this course called science technology and social change and the vice chancellor at that time professor ram joshi had the insight 
of uh, asking us to collect make a book of readings selected material uh, from which the students could read and the uh, their instructors also could read because the instructors may not necessarily be science teachers or technology uh, conversant teachers so we had this book of readings uh, which was quite substantial uh, more than 400 pages and the university brought it out uh, pretty cheap and as unfortunately things happened with the change in the vice chancellorship uh, uh, after some lapse of time this course also sort of degenerated into what is called a pass fail course uh, so and then uh, everybody was worried only about uh, guides and uh, you know passing so the book of readings was not used anymore uh, but we did do, spend a lot of time selecting the readings and uh, seeing them through press and initially giving uh, seminars about the material at various places in uh, the various colleges that came under the University of Mumbai. So that was the only uh, book which you can say I have produced. So did your father also influence your choice of an academic career? Uh, no, no, neither parent uh, influenced me in that way. Uh, I don't think I, I, you know, people think sometimes that I'm more of uh, more in math than in engineering, uh, maybe for a different reason. But um, I, I didn't have any difficulty in math and I liked it. So that was not because of my parents uh, who were in mathematics, but just on my own. I like the subject, but I like science as well. And subsequently, I thought I'll go in for engineering and not for a, a degree in mathematics. Uh, and even after the bachelor's degree, I went on for a PhD, MTech, MS and PhD program in engineering, electrical engineering rather than mathematics. But while doing the, um, uh, the uh, postgraduate uh, graduate uh, work, I took a lot of math courses. And uh, that was because uh, the kind of mathematics that I had up till that time was a little different uh, in uh, nature in the following sense. Our math courses at the undergrad undergraduate level, even today, I would say, in India and elsewhere, are more oriented towards standard material. And uh, they do not enable you to get a feeling for what mathematics is like. Uh, for engineering students, it's mostly applied math. Uh, so one has no idea of pure math, that there is something called pure mathematics, which people do pursue and enjoy and has maybe eventually some application. So uh, fortunately at the University of Illinois at Urbana or now Urbana Champaign, I picked up uh, a lot of math of the pure kind, uh, starting with uh, real variables and then topology, measure theory, uh, functional analysis and so on, which was useful to me, of course, in my uh, thesis work also. But I could get a better appreciation of what uh, mathematics is on the on the whole, and not just the applied part of it. So because of that, sometimes my colleagues, you would think that I am a, more a mathematician than an engineer. But I let it be at that. So what have been the key influences in your life at VJTI and at Urbana Champaign? Which researchers influenced you the most in your field, sir? At school, uh, I remember uh, very fondly a teacher of mine. His name was Sohoni. Uh, he was a teacher of English, but he was interested in science and uh, even history and uh, so on. And he, although school was perhaps a little too early, uh, he did try to see whether we could look at subjects in a somewhat different way. So, in other words, not simply uh, uh, take the material, work out the problems, or answer the questions, uh, commit to memory, and thing, things of that sort, but think a little bit about it. So, even when writing, uh, say, in the English course, an essay or uh, comprehensive uh, passage and so on, he would uh, make us think uh, uh, and go about it, even though we are not going to become uh, literary figures, how you can do a better job and things like that. 
so his was a distinct influence as far as science is concerned at school level we didn't have really much of deep science anyway this was back in 1950s so we can't uh, expect could not have expected much at that time and in the engineering program unlike iit we had no physics or chemistry so unlike the iitians who sometimes complain that they have to do a lot of physics and chemistry although they have finished it uh, we really, we had none whatever physics or chemistry was there it was in the our engineering courses which was also good in a way because it was immediately relevant and connected so we had physics chemistry in college of course two years of college but not in the engineering program whereas uh, that's a sort of a uh, mark of iit uh, education today in almost perhaps all the iits that there is uh, what we call good science base so it's called a science based engineering program uh, although the science base has been reduced yeah. over the years but nevertheless it is still there so that was uh, the uh, the up to the college level and then uh, at the uh, graduate level uh, i was uh, sort of encouraged by my professor uh, professor jv cruz junior to go in for whatever i liked so like the math courses and the other courses that i took and uh, so i was able to explore uh, quite a bit uh, of various kinds of things and uh, one book which finally sort of uh, decided what i was going to do and work in control theory was a book that had been published only only recently at that time by uh, a russian uh, mathematician pontryagin and his uh, co-workers and it was called a mathematical theory of optimal control processes so this book uh, made a very deep impression on me understand uh, trying to read it or follow it was not easy at all and even today uh, there are a few doubts in my mind about certain passages in the book and i'm not sure whether i understood it uh, perfectly and so on but uh, that sort of uh, made me choose uh, control theory as my principal subject but the other thing that happened was as i told you just now i was allowed freedom to explore and in doing so i sort of was led to look into what one may call the foundations of mathematics that is uh, okay it's all technical mathematics is one thing pure mathematics is another you have theorems and you have proofs and so on but uh, what are the basic issues are there any foundational issues and uh, i did uh, discover that there are and this led me into uh, educating myself on logic i never had any formal course on logic uh, in all my uh, schooling and college and university education so i had to educate myself and uh, but that's where my interest into logic foundations of mathematics uh, started because of uh, looking at mathematics a little more deeply going beyond you know the courses that you take uh, looking at the concepts looking at ideas like truth and so on uh, so that's what led me into and then uh, side side by side of course the issue of truth theory comes up in science as well i mean one would simply one can take say physics as it is or chemistry as it is and not ask any questions as to what is the significance is are these things true or in what sense uh, is it where is the role of experiment theory and things like that so side side by side i was looking at those issues and that's how my interest in philosophy of science uh, began and continued and eventually or even right from the beginning i uh, realized that you had to take a look at the historical development of the subject and not just take it as it is today or as it is when you encounter it uh, it is not to say that you have to read the history in detail okay because uh, that is an enterprise uh, which involves uh, too much time uh, and patience and in fact at my matriculation i uh, dropped the subject of history and instead chose the subject of arithmetic because at that time the history that i was taught was not history of ideas history of concepts history of development but you know the standard history of uh, dynasties and uh, nations and this that and the other 
which uh, left you no uh, choice or time to think or ask any questions. You know, you just accepted standard history material and reproduced it uh, in the exams to do well. So that's why I dropped it. But history of the development of ideas or uh, development of concepts, no matter what, uh, it could be about language, it could be about uh, geography, it could be even about history, the development of historical, the very idea of historical concepts. That uh, was, uh, was coming. A collection from my second year at IIT, when uh, I saw you coming out of the central library with a huge number of books, you know, I can't remember how much it was, maybe around 10 or 11 or perhaps even 15. And you took this huge stack of books and you tied it to your bicycle carrier using a rope. And uh, so seeing that as a very young undergraduate student had a very strong uh, impression on my mind, you know, to, uh, to see that you know, somebody could actually read so many books and, and uh, bring them back the next month and reissue another set of books. So, so when did this reading habit originate and how did it evolve? Sir? Uh, well, as I mentioned earlier, uh, my father and mother had their collection of books at home. So we had, uh, but they were, of course, uh, specific books, uh, a few other maybe literary books and so on, but not many. Uh, and in the uh, school, as well as in college and engineering college, there was very little incentive for doing any uh, reading beyond the text and the exam uh, related material. So it was only at the master's level and later that uh, I uh, realized that uh, you have to read. And uh, fortunately uh, at the university, uh, there are a number of libraries. There was a main central library or main library. There was a math library, physics, engineering, and so on. And you could borrow books and not just one, but as many as you wished. Of course, you would have to return them within that period but uh, nobody asks you. Uh, so, you know, I, what I would do is if I would pick up a book, go to the uh, racks or the shelves and browse and see if there are something interesting, then pick it and bring it home and then read a little bit from it or maybe more and so on. But then maybe some other book also came to my notice. So then I would go and pick up the other book and things like that. Since there was no limit on the number of books at that time, uh, or maybe even today, so uh, I could borrow quite a few books. Uh, it is not to say that I read a book from first page to last. That was not the idea. But I was attracted to a particular book, maybe because of a chapter or because of uh, treatment of a particular topic and things like that. So then I would go and borrow the book, then keep it with me for some time so that I became more familiar with it and then uh, read whatever was necessary, make notes and things like that and then return it uh, a little later. So this is how I ended up uh, borrowing a, uh, quite a number of books at a time uh, from the library. Uh, at the IIT Kanpur library also, there was a freedom to borrow as many books as you could. Although subsequently somebody from thought that, you know, maybe too many books are being issued and so on. So they tried to put a limit. And then I argued that, uh, you know, the uh, question asked to me, uh, or rather the uh, notice that was given to me said, uh, I, I'm sure that you're not e reading all these books. Uh, so I replied by saying, no, no, I'm reading each and every one of them, but I'm not reading them from first page to last page. So, and if anybody wants a book, I'll return it as early as possible so that I will not be cornering a book. The intention is not to borrow a book so that nobody else can read it but you have books on the library shelves which are not being borrowed at all or being borrowed very rarely. And if you feel like borrowing it, then you borrow it and then you keep it for some time not for uh, the rest of your life, but for a little longer than is probably normally one would think you borrow a book and return it in a week or so. I would keep it a little longer. So uh, that's how it went on at IIT Kanpur. In IIT Bombay, there was a limit of 15 books at a time. Uh, then I pleaded that the number should be increased. So it was increased to 20. And I believe now you can borrow even more than 20. Of course, I would borrow more than 20 with the special permission of the librarian or borrow in somebody else's name and things like that. 
so that's how it went on. But as you can expect, I was not only borrowing books from the library, I was also buying books. And that has been there for a long time. And of course, one cannot afford to buy uh, new books all the time. So, and you are also fa probably familiar that in the city of Mumbai, there are places where you have on the footpath or on the pavement uh, old books uh, which are being sold. So I would visit these various places and pick up many of these books. And I also joined a few libraries. Uh, and there was one library in the city, or there is still. I became a member. They had a good collection. And I think it is unfortunate in a way that the library decided to discard some books, or they used the unfortunate term weeded out, as if, uh, you know, there's grass and this book is a weed. But then they would offer it to their uh, members. And I picked up so many books at a price which was uh, you know, astoundingly low, something like the minimum bidding price was five rupees. So I would bid five rupees or maybe five and a half rupees or six rupees and things like that. And I picked up so many of the older books, classics. For example, one immediately comes to my mind is Clark Maxwell, uh, who is known for electromagnetism, also known for, say, thermodynamics. I wrote a book titled Theory of Heat for working people or workmen. Uh, many authors did. So this Theory of Heat book, which has hardly any equation, a lot of material, but not simply saying things or describing experiments and things like that. I have that with me. So it goes back to the 1870s. Uh, I have the first edition, the oldest edition. So, you know, I picked up quite a few books of that kind. Of course, I was buying some new books as well. Uh, if they were absolutely necessary, they were not available in the library and if they were not too expensive. So my uh, book reading from the library was supplemented by these books at home, where, of course, nobody would ask me to return them. And I would also very reluctantly uh, lend it to somebody uh, because, you know, suppose the person forgot to return, then what? And I would never, uh, I never discarded or weeded out a single book from my collection. So it has become very large now. Sometimes uh, I don't worry about it uh, because uh, what happens after me, but that's <laughs> not for me to, but it can, it could cause some problem, but I hope they don't uh, end up uh, in the garbage. Uh, they, are, they fall into some hands of some reader or the other. So that's the whole uh, affair with uh, books. Uh, so, of course, people ask me, when are you writing your book? And the answer is, uh, yes, yes, I'm thinking of it. I'm working on it. I prepared even outlines and things like that. I had a, some grant for a book writing project, prepared some material, but uh, did not come to a stage where I could put up a book. And that was mainly because for some reason, uh, I thought that I will not write a textbook. Uh, the, the reason, main reason was that there are already so many good textbooks. Uh, choose any subject. Uh, now, I'm, I'm not talking about only textbooks which are uh, oriented towards exams. There are many textbooks, of course, which have something to do with exams. So there are problems, solutions and things like that. But they are pretty wide uh, in their scope. So when there are good textbooks from which I have learned, uh, do I now write another textbook? Uh, if it doesn't go beyond the usual textbook in substantial way, then I mean, I can write it so that I make a name and maybe I can make some money also, which is what many people have done. You write a good textbook and it's not a crime to write a good textbook. If it sells well, then you make some money out of it also. But again, they didn't write it for the money. They wrote it probably for the name or the, because simply they uh, had the idea of writing a textbook. So that's why uh, I have not yet come out with a book, although I have sort of material which could be added to uh, textbooks. So these, of course, have, are available uh, as uh, papers or as uh, chapters and things like that. And I have been uh, talking about them uh, in my courses. Uh, which you, of course, encountered uh, when you took uh, courses with me. Yes, sir. 
Sir, I recollect an elective course in logic and foundations of mathematics taught by you in my final semester at IIT in 1992. And what was uh, amazing about this course was that it was taught by three faculty members and it had five students. And it generated a lot of very intense and lively discussions and resulted in an enormous amount of learning and uh, a great sense of enjoyment you know, for me as a student by this entire process. You earlier mentioned that uh, your interest in philosophy of science and logic and foundations of mathematics originated at your time at Urbana Champaign when you were a graduate yes. school. So my question is, how did your interest in these subjects evolve with time after your graduate school? Well, uh, there's one thing that uh, I will say about the IIT system of education. Certainly at that time when I started my career in teaching at the IITs, but maybe even today is uh, that there is a considerable amount of freedom that we have. Uh, well, of course, one can say that we also have a little more time than do regular college or university teachers because they have to deal with a much larger number of students and teach at this one at the same time maybe two three different courses and things like that whereas at the iits uh, and rightly so the emphasis is on the contact between the teacher and the student and uh, therefore you will not find a faculty who is teaching three courses at the same time because it's very difficult to do justice to different subjects uh, to the same extent so the iit system allows that and it is because of that that uh, in a way i could continue my education or learning as i mentioned earlier i had no course in logic ever so i could read and uh, study and learn uh, logic in fact that's what happened in 1970 when i was in the tifr tata institute of fundamental research for one year and the university of bombay had started a master's program in computer science at that time with no faculty and uh, the RTIFR was uh, requested to help and the syllabus was there or the curriculum was there it had a subject called mathematical logic and uh, a few textbooks also were mentioned and uh, I was asked whether I would teach it at that time in 1970 as I was telling you I had barely picked up my uh, logic background but I just said yes and then, you know, with the textbook in my hand, uh, I started reading it. I would be just a little ahead of the students. And that was good because, you know, it was not as if I knew everything and I was just uh, mouthing it out and the students would absorb it. But whatever difficulties I had, I could uh, sort of use them when communicating to the students. And like your class, that class also had maybe about 10 students. Uh, who were doing their uh, MSc or MA in mathematics and they were curious and they picked up this subject mathematical logic for the first time in the history of the university the subject was taught so so I went on and there is a good book uh, introduction to mathematical logic by Mendelssohn and uh, so that's the way you know we uh, my colleague Professor Gupta and myself went on at IIT Bombay uh, with uh, our two courses, uh, one was the logic and foundations of mathematics, which you took, and the other was history and philosophy of science. We were learning uh, along with the students, and therefore a lot of reading material beyond, uh, there are no textbook as such. There would be some two, three books which one would uh, like to look at, but there would be a lot of reading material, articles in various uh, journals, which if they were not available, easily we would uh, make a xerox copy and make it available and things like that this was before the days of the internet so nothing was available really outside of printed material so that's how it began and you and your colleagues had to read some papers and present them in as a part of the course so this learning by ourselves uh, continued uh, till almost the end of our career in the iit because I remember that course with uh, a lot of enthusiasm and I was surprised to learn that uh, you actually taught this course uh, first to the students of University of Bombay even before uh, 
you thought this course at uh, IIT. This kind of news to me, sir. I, I didn't know this. Going to a topic that is very close to your heart, namely science and mathematics curriculum in schools. So what are the deficiencies of the current approach? And, and how can a scientific temper be built in students? And how can science and mathematics curriculum be improved? Uh, yes, now this is something uh, which uh, we have been, my Professor Gupta and myself and other few other colleagues have been thinking about and worrying over and so on. The curriculum, as far as the content goes, you know, the present school curriculum in India, whether it is state government board or the central board of secondary education or other boards and so on, as far as the content goes, it's very good. In fact, it's even stronger than, say, American school curricula uh, in many respects. As far as, say, the science and math is concerned, it is definitely stronger, but it might be weaker on the culture, the literature side and so on. Similarly, our engineering curriculum in the IIT, of course, is excellent, quite comparable with curricula elsewhere. So as far as content is concerned, there is uh, no complaint whatsoever. But uh, the, the question that comes to one's mind uh, is the following, or the question, questions, really. One is, OK, I started and I continued, and I went on till my PhD. And then fortunately, I was able to continue beyond PhD. So I was able to continue my learning beyond PhD. But for many, they stop at some stage. Some children drop out after 10th, or they do not pass the 10th, so they quit. So what have they gained? during that period then they may stop after the uh, if they uh, enter college have only two years of it and then quit or they stop at the bachelor's degree and quit what have they gained which uh, would be of use to them for the rest of their life because uh, you may have a degree uh, in science and you may take up a job in a bank uh, which has uh, and a job that has nothing to do with your science background and that's because one just doesn't know what's going to happen to you as you go ahead, whether you will be a banker or an information theory person or a carpenter or uh, whatever, you know, or a teacher for that matter. So you believe that you must know everything. So the curriculum is packed with content. No wonder the children, many children do badly because maybe there are limits up to how much you can take in at a time. If you are given more time, perhaps you can take that material. But uh, you lag behind, then you go on falling further and further behind. So after 10th or up to 10th, you go and then you say quits. No more. This is not for me. And I will choose some other line, maybe going for some trade or whatever, which is equally good uh, in the sense if I have to earn a livelihood, uh, that also earns me a livelihood. And if I can't do something uh, that I don't, uh, I'm not able to do it, let me do something I can do. So, but then there are issues, for example, uh, the scientific temper, uh, something that you mentioned. And of course, uh, for some reason, uh, that expression scientific temper has become quite popular or became quite popular. In fact, uh, there was uh, even a committee uh, set up many years ago. But what is the scientific temper exactly? What is it about? Or what does it have? So it's not enough to have knowledge in science. It's not enough to have knowledge in chemistry or physics or biology at some level. To know, uh, let's say, in some sense about heredity, about chromosomes and things like that. That knowledge is not scientific temper. Getting to know scientific uh, knowledge, learning, is not enough for scientific temper. This is what I feel and many feel, that it's not enough. That is because learning or knowing can simply be a one-way street. There is a textbook you read and you remember and you reproduce and you understand a little bit and that's how it goes. After a little while, it uh, drops out of your mind. Uh, of course, one tends to forget and rightly so. You can't remember everything. So the process of science uh, building or the process of technology uh, building over the uh, centuries 
that somehow is completely left out. Now, I'm not saying that you should have a course in history of physics, because that again would be like a course in history of whatever. So it will be standard material given out, facts to be remembered, to be reproduced, and so on. But when you are learning, and this is difficult, whether you can be encouraged to ask questions, to have some doubts in your mind, uh, some gaps in your learning, so that things become a little clearer uh, as you go along. Unfortunately, there is very little scope for it in the school curriculum. You know, things are very tight and no wonder. Teacher has to handle not just 20 children, but maybe 50, 70 children. Noisy class, crowded classroom, too much material, too many homework assignments, this, that, and the other. Okay? So you can't blame it on the teacher, but somehow it is getting left out completely. So <clears throat> we had the feeling that uh, since the curriculum was good, maybe one can spend a little bit of time from, say, first grade to 10th grade on some of these things and yet pick up enough material for you so as to at the end you will do well in the subject. So any school subject that you can take, say take your mathematics or take your physics or chemistry or bio, one finds that it is related to other subjects. It is not completely divorced or separated from the other subjects. Unfortunately, it has become so. The science teacher is not too confident about her or his mathematics. The math teacher is not confident about his or her physics. Uh, both of them shy away from biology because they may not have studied it or liked it and so on. And technology is again remote. You can use technology, but no questions about what goes on inside technology are asked or uh, learned. So all these things are separated. And in addition to that, they are separated from your life as you are living it, unfortunately so. The child's life is not connected with the science that the child is learning or with the mathematics that the child is learning or with the biology that the child is learning. Unfortunately so. Whereas that has not been so in the past. And in the past, there was no sort of school education worth talking about. People like uh, Newton or Faraday or Maxwell and so on did not really pick much in school. Much of their learning was later and on their own. So we have a little scope for that today. We have to pick it up in school and college and university and be done with it. So you have to look at these connections. And I'll give an example, uh, which probably you have suffered under me. In uh, network theory or in electrical, basic electric circuits, there is a, a topic called Kirchhoff's laws. Kirchhoff was a German uh, scientist, shall we say, who worked in the 1840s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and so on. So there are these two honorable laws under his name, Kirchhoff's current law and Kirchhoff's voltage law. And they are stated in the books. You solve problems, you use them, and there it goes. But not many people are curious. I mean, who was this Kirchhoff? What did he do when he uh, wrote about his laws? Did he really state them the way we find them today? Did he do experiments to discover the laws? Or what did he do? Now, this requires uh, energy and uh, time to explore. You have to look at Kirchhoff's original writing, get the hold of the paper. It is in German. Then try to translate it and get a feeling for what it was. And then it's a big surprise, of course, that what he did was nothing like what you and I uh, learn or teach uh, today. So now here is something. Uh, well, it took me some time to become familiar with it, but I keep telling my colleagues that fortunately now a translation of Kirchhoff's paper is available very easily. It's very easy to read. This is 1846, 1847. So the math at that time was also not that advanced, neither was the physics. So any EE student today can read that paper not a very long paper either. But if I were to teach the subject, I would insist that he or she read it. If not for any other reason, that here was this man by whose laws we swear. And look, no, we don't want to spend even one hour reading what he wrote, which is not beyond our understanding at all. 
whether it has any use subsequently or value is a different thing but it's a sort of a cultural issue you know if uh, kirchhoff's law is a part of your electrical engineering culture you better know a little bit about uh, how that culture was built up so this is how as i went on i would find topics which are not uh, taught well uh, in this sense with a proper understanding appreciation of the background the context and uh, so on so that students can think about it and enjoy it uh, that if i were in kirchhoff's place what would i have done would i have discovered his law or not what would be the background what would i think or if he did it in some way can i do it in some other way and things like that so you were uh, you re recalled the other day when we were talking ohm's law and yes. v equal to ir is the standard statement and going uh, even uh, to the ridiculous extent of writing it as i equal to v by r and uh, it, you know <laughs> things of that sort what did ohm do way back in 1826 well there were no meters at that time so not volt meter ammeter and there was no ohm meter either so what did he do well let's find out so i spent some time finding it out and this iit job does give us this time and freedom to do it and you discover that no 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 it was quite different from what you and i i have learned and have been told so topic after topic like this uh, you know you find out that you have not really understood how that particular concept or the particular theory or the particular law came about and therefore you then you understand it much better then only the statement of it and then application or use of it subsequently and so on and this does have some uh, i mean it is not entirely without some uh, shall i say benefit to you or to me so uh, you know there is a topic i have a control theory person uh, in the beginning at least so there is a topic called the routh algorithm uh, a stability criterion same question there is a section in the book which says that you know there is a special case when the algorithm fails then what you do you do, do this and that's it but why uh, why do i do this so what did routh do in the 1870s what was his approach the books don't give the proof for the routh algorithm neither routh's proof nor any other so i go back and find out what it is and then i find out that look i am able to extend it to that special case without just that hand washing uh, kind of argument uh, but quite justified argument and so i was able to write a paper which was published in the ieee transactions on automatic control in 1984 so it's not that all this was useless <laughs> i could produce a paper out of that in the sense then a reader reading that paper would have a better understanding of the topic that uh, he or she was learning and i was happy when maybe another 20 years later or maybe a little less one textbook uh, writer of renown was able to or what uh, did mention not only my paper but also my derivation spent two pages on that gave examples and so on and so forth so at least one textbook author had uh, read my paper found it worthwhile and put it in his book there are not many others uh, today i'm sure there is no control theory book which uh, mentions my result either i was able to extend it to polynomials with complex uh, numbers as coefficient and of course extend the algorithm because it was no longer uh, workable the way it was but there it was you know i could do something which came out of my curiosity and out of my desire to find out another example that i would give and that came out of the history and philosophy of science course uh, we uh, we thought that look we talk about einstein but nobody reads einstein's uh, original papers let's read them so along with the students we looked at einstein's 1905 paper which sometimes goes under the name his special relativity theory paper it was on uh, the, uh, the on the uh, uh, the uh, maxwell equations Uh, in the for uh, moving bodies as it was called on the electrodynamics of moving bodies that was the uh, english translation of the german title so let's look at this paper 1905 as you can expect that paper is not difficult to read at all in fact the initial part of it requires no knowledge of electromagnetism at all 
just a little bit of uh, mathematics which uh, everybody has picked up by by 12th grade and then some knowledge of maxwell's equations and so on but one is able to see what einstein was trying to do what he was struggling with why he wrote that paper but then i was not happy with uh, what i was reading i felt that einstein had not completed the job and maybe i can say a little bit uh, although it's a digression of sort that is einstein was worried about the time concept in physics and he says so explicitly in that paper there are others who were also worried poincare uh, a physicist mathematician was worried and had written about it and lorentz himself had uh, thought about it and wrote papers on it the time concept and when you have different frames of reference what does time mean this was einstein's worry and so he tried to work it out in his paper but the space concept how do you assign coordinates that part he said methods of euclidean geometry so he was willing to accept euclidean geometry at that time but i felt that was not enough i had to you know go into a little more detail so how does one pick up build not only a time concept but a, the space concept and so i was led to think more about it that is how or what would be a frame of reference everybody talks about frame of reference and without really explaining what it is on the one hand you say you know you have some coordinate axis but if you go and find out how people determine the location they are not do, doing that at all the xyz coordinates on the blackboard is not the xyz coordinates of the laboratory at all so how how is it being done based on that i was able to come up with a paper which i was able to publish in a respected journal devoted to these issues called foundations of physics which was published in 2006 and this was a fairly lengthy paper uh, the point is that my reading of einstein not being satisfied with what he did therefore reading quite a bit more thinking about it uh, there was time of course at hand so i could spend that time and then but one can come up with something which is publishable so it's not that uh, you know what is the use of it uh, you feel better but uh, that's not all uh, but whether somebody other than me or many others who read that paper i can't force it on people again i would hope that physics faculty who teach a course on special theory of relativity would take a look at that paper mathematics is not uh, the and the physics is not overwhelming at all but they have to spend some time they should not discard it as say saying it is historical look we are not interested in what einstein did we know much better today or uh, philosophical look we have no time for philosophy what is time what is space blah blah no but <laughs> that is that's not the issue it is not doing philosophy or doing uh, history but learning uh, and looking at einstein looking at his concepts and asking questions and things like that uh, don't you think that uh, our students deserve something like that i think they do but no you are pressed for time so you write down the lorentz equations and then you say that okay they can be derived in some way let's not bother let's start using them there are lots of problems worked out uh, you know Uh, length contraction time dilation and many problems which look very interesting and puzzling and so on and then you are able to solve it and you are quite happy about the whole thing this is okay but you can go beyond that by reading einstein by uh, asking these questions uh, uh, on your own and then trying to find your answers or maybe looking up others and to get the answer so that's how i would say this scientific temper business is not to be equated with telling teaching a lot of science and i'll give another example where i have not uh, produced a paper yet but take the subject of astronomy what is it that we learn in school at age 7 or 8 or even earlier you are told about the solar system okay you are told that the sun is in the center center of what the planetary system but where is that planetary system is it hanging out in space somewhere no we don't know and there are planets which go around it in certain ways and so on and 
people at an early time thought that no 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 the sun was station the earth was stationary the planets were going around the sun but we know better now scientists know that no no that's not the case okay so you take astronomy and it doesn't go beyond much beyond that because today's kids are smarter teachers are smarter so they are taught about say the uh, satellites of jupiter and there are now nine what are their names and this that and the other and then there is a competition in which if you are able to answer the questions correctly you get a prize is this what astronomy should be reduced to but look at that many of my uh, seniors my contemporaries and juniors have had this bit of astronomy but as a result have they given up their interest in astrology astrology their astrological beliefs no they have not because the astronomy that they learned has not been related to their astrological beliefs at all they have no idea about the calendar they have no idea about how the calendar depends basically on astronomy you cannot have a, a calendar or any system worth the name unless you have an astronomical basis for it and then in my view astrology is a sort of a misuse of astronomy or a statistical misuse of astronomy unfortunately we don't even know the basis for that statistics so you are born under the sign uh, this that and the other areas maybe and the planet mars was there at that time, time so your patrika the horoscope is made and then you are told that look this is what is likely your personality will be of this type and then if there is saturn in and some bad uh, aspect then you better do something wear something or this so you know the scientific temper if it only meant being told about the astronomical uh, view of the world not galaxy and so on but just the solar system uh, well that has not served the purpose of uh, making people rethink and these astrological beliefs do affect people sometimes very seriously uh, you know someone may get, have difficulty in getting married simply because uh, he or she has mars in the horoscope at some terrible place okay so unless you find a matching person you can't uh, go ahead and think of marriage i mean what kind of a thing is this this is or uh, you know you do some things like okay ekadashi is very important but there's nothing particular about ekadashi in the lunar uh, monthly cycle that you have to do a fast on that ekadashi it is not related with the position of the moon in the sky or the position of the planets so if you have to fast for a good reason let's say you don't have to do it on an ekadashi day at all you can do it on some other of course you may choose ekadashi because it's convenient day okay but if some other culture does the fasting on some other day well because they are told that it is good on that day then and then you argue about it and then you get into difficulty uh, you know religious matters you have overlooked completely the background of the whole thing so you find that a particular religion like your religion emphasizes the importance of fasting but you prefer to do it at this time and someone else prefers to do it at some other time and you and that person will never get together and find out hey this is what the whole thing is why you do it at that time and why you do it at this time uh, it's because simply it's a convenient calendrical thing and nothing for example sunday is that an auspicious day in some way absolutely no astronomical basis for that but say one week in a day for some reason some cultures felt was to be left aside for thinking about god or about religious matters about culture about other people and so on and that became sunday and you have to do it every week so every sunday but there's nothing you know sacred in theory or in principle about a particular day of the week at all some people feel saturday is bad or friday is bad and things like that or monday is good thursday is good now where is the scientific temperature now uh, temper uh, now your knowledge in science was not adequate because it has not been linked with other things that you learned so we thought that there was time in the school curriculum to do this because there's plenty you have 10 years i mean children are taught so much year after year after year uh, much of it they have they forget or they give up 
maybe we can have a little time spent on these things. Unfortunately, uh, we did not meet with any success because the school system, in fact, the education system as a whole and the school education system in particular is very difficult to change. And for reasons, you know, first of all, large numbers, they need textbooks. They need teachers who need to know the textbook. They need exams. They need, uh, you know, therefore questions, answers and things like that. Everything is geared towards that. Nothing is geared towards understanding, learning, learning concepts and things like that. So it's extremely difficult to change. Uh, there is what is called a constructionist movement in science uh, learning today that at least let children do some experiments in science so that they just don't have paper learning of science, paper learning of chemistry, but do some experiments in chemistry or maybe in biology and things like that. So they can, they can construct their own knowledge. But again, there is not enough time and the way it is done is they are supposed to construct standard knowledge. So at the end of it, uh, you know, they would construct exactly what you want them to construct. So in other words, there is no urge inside the child to be curious, to want to learn, to want to do things, to learn from what you do, to learn from what you observe. All that that goes under the name of science, it is left out uh, completely. So that's unfortunately the case, but I'm hoping that with the internet now, there are people who might be interested in, uh, you know, spending some time on that and uh, therefore get into this and maybe one can uh, try to do some things together, uh, not on a local scale, but on a global scale even. The same issue is there in American or other countries. The science education there is as dogmatic as any. And there are sections on scientific method which the children have to learn by heart. So they have to be able to say, what is the scientific method? Step one, observation. Robert, observe what? As if you're not observing things all the time? No, observation. Then what? Hypothesis. That observation is supposed to lead you to think of some hypothesis. But what is this business of hypothesis? Then maybe you have an experimental test. And then if it doesn't match your hypothesis, you go back, change your hypothesis, do more observations. That's the scientific method. And that is what you learn in grade three. And then subsequently you forget about it because you are never asked to use that scientific method in the science that you're learning. But so this is how it goes. So maybe one can just give up on it and say, no, scientific temper cannot be taught anywhere at any time. If you get it, well, it's okay. If you don't get it, if you still continue to believe in many things, well, it's okay. After all, you can't do everything for everybody or one can't do everything for oneself. So that's okay. Leave it as it is. Okay. So that's where matters stand uh, with me today. But I have not given up hope. So about Ohm's law and uh, the actual experiments of Ohm and formulation of uh, Ohm's law, I have a clear recollection that in our second year, uh, you actually came to the classroom and wrote down a set of values on the blackboard uh, under a parameter X and another set of values under a parameter Y. And you gave uh, us an assignment to actually find a relation between X and Y. And uh, I recollect that uh, by the next day, there was only one student in the class who was able to find a relation between X and Y. And uh, you had told us that this was a historical uh, experiment in science, but you had not revealed, uh, you know, the exact nature of the experiment of which law it was. And as a class, we were very surprised to learn that it was Ohm's law because uh, our, our idea of Ohm's law, you know, was a straight line because of V equal to IR. But then, mm -hmm. uh, as you said earlier, uh, you pointed out to us in class that the voltmeters didn't exist during the time of Ohm. So therefore, voltage had to be indirectly, you know, measured. So, so this uh, historical aspect uh, is something which I recollect uh, very well from your classes, uh, sir. And I also clearly recollect you talking about, uh, you know, the Kirchhoff and uh, you know, the the historical aspects of Kirchhoff and his and his writings. So, so, yeah, so, right. yeah. so listening so to your answers, is, you know, is very nostalgic for this. Uh, the way uh, you use mathematics today is to fit equations 
two data. Okay, so all you have to do is choose the equation, find out a parameter, maybe find out the best parameter and things like that. Okay, so data is there and then you fit an equation or think of an equation that fits the data. This is what the application of mathematics uh, is today. Uh, partly yes, but not quite because what is the data itself? And uh, your fitting of that data by uh, the favorite equation of yours or uh, the uh, model of yours uh, may not be adequate. So in the case of Ohm's law, the data was such that X was not linearly related to Y at all because this X and Y are not voltage and current at all. X was the length of a wire that he was working with at one time and then Y was the intensity of the current as he measured it in some way when that wire of length X was connected. So you had current I and wire of length X and the relationship between Y and X was not linear at all. So in fact, it was a little complicated, but Ohm was not just doing curve fitting. He was thinking about it. Well, what makes the current flow or the charges flow? What is the resistance after all? And playing with it, he was able to discover the law and then fit the parameters fairly well to the law, uh, to the formula that he was thinking about. And this formula gives rise to two concepts which are there in our learning today. One is what may be called the internal resistance of the rest of the circuit. So you have the wire which are changing and measuring currents in, but there is the rest of the circuit, the battery and the connecting wires. So that has a resistance. Today we call it the internal resistance of the source. That's not how Ohm thought about it. He thought about resistance everywhere. So the wire as well as the rest of the circuit. The second parameter was what we today call the voltage or EMF for the battery. Now that was a concept which Ohm had to develop on his own. There was no ready-made concept that a battery has a voltage. You take a voltmeter and measure it. He had no measurement of that voltage at all. He did not measure voltages because he could not measure voltages. Okay. So this was a theoretical concept which came about as a result of his struggling. And he said that this is something that the battery does. So whatever you want to call it, well, eventually it was called the electromotive force of the battery because we think or he thought that when something was happening, charges were being moving around in the circuit. So there must be something moving at, think of it as force, it is electromotive force. So the way he got the law was indirectly through this and only much later that by the time of Kirchhoff, Ohm's law was well formulated. So for Kirchhoff, it was voltage, current and the uh, resistance and the relationship between them. Okay. So 20 years later, Kirchhoff could use uh, the Ohm's law in that form, but not Ohm. So you and your colleagues had to struggle with that, how to fit, you know, for the Y and X data, how to fit a nice function. I don't know how the, the only one person figured it out. Maybe he looked up the <laughs> uh, work on by Ohm and got the answer, or maybe he was free to, or he thought he would choose, may, try many things, and he fitted it all right. So that was the fun part of it. Yes, sir. It was uh, you know a lot of excitement, you know, in those days. <laughs> even now it seems Maybe very nostalgic. Some disappointment also that no, I could not figure it out. <laughs> yeah, well, I would not have been able to figure it out either if yes. I had not read Ohm's work. I would be at a loss. And incidentally, sir, since we are on this topic, yes, sir. today's discussion about the the. Uh, uh, spreading of COVID. Or yes. the, uh, unfortunately, I find that many people are just trying to fit a mathematical formula or think of a curve of a particular kind. And, you know, the New York uh, governor is able to talk about the plateau and the peak and the rising and the falling. But what is the mechanism of propagation of this disease? Right. What is the what are the very many issues that are involved? and how they do they interact. If they can be encapsulated by a single formula, it would be very nice. But can they be encapsulated? In Mumbai and in India, we are still struggling because the curve has, is showing no signs of a plateau. It is growing. Every day we have additional cases 
which are sometimes more than the previous day. But we are uh, much better than other countries, that's about all. But if we believe the model, we have to reach a plateau. So when will that be? When the number of cases is 1 lakh or 10, 1 million or what? Do we have to wait? Maybe not, because the way we are looking at it is we should not be looking at it that way at all. If we are able to do testing, as they say, the first step, and then contact tracing, and then uh, the uh, isolation or quarantine, if that is done, then the model is no longer applicable. And we might be able to see a sudden drop in the uh, uh, rate of increase, and maybe even going to zero uh, after some time, if we are able to identify, if we are able to uh, the quarantine, or isolate, because uh, in principle, if at this moment in time, uh, there's a population in Mumbai, if we are able to identify all the people in Mumbai who have that virus in some way, and we are able to quarantine them properly, okay, I'm sure the numbers can come down drastically. Of course, of those who are quarantined, some may not survive, unfortunately, uh, there's, since there's no known medicine, uh, that might happen. but the growth will stop almost instantaneously. So, but we are not able to test everybody. We are not able to do contact tracing fully, and we are not able to do quarantining fully. So your curves, you can play with them, so-and-so's model, so-and-so's model, this, that, and the other. But that doesn't, uh, <laughs> you know, help us in any substantial way, uh, except the, uh, I'm impressed by the New York City, uh, state governor he has a good understanding of many things and he's able to you know day in and day out uh, able to say something about the coronavirus covid in his state but uh, so it needs much more than that maybe one has to go to epidemiology read about uh, various kinds of uh, epidemiological situations how things spread maybe through oral, through water, through uh, contact, direct contact, physical contact, and things like that. And different models work in different cases. And in different settings, in very thickly populated areas, in very thinly populated areas, but in the US, people are distributed, but still they come together in a mall or at some picnics and things like that. Is that why things have spread in Spain and Italy and in the US? Because you know, they are spread out, but they come together in large numbers. They go to swimming pools, they go to malls and things like that. And if they have not done uh, the other things that I mentioned, like masks and hand washing and so on. So they have spread now uh, beyond, almost beyond their control. So model making, mathematics is not model making, or model making is not adequate for understanding a phenomenon. You have to go a little bit deeper into that phenomenon itself. And then we can, at the same time, you can start playing with your models, and you may come up with something uh, which works and even tells uh, what is what should be done. So that's uh, my general uh, view about mathematics, science, technology, culture, their mutual relationship. That's very uh, good to hear, sir. Sir, so about your association with IIT Bombay that spans six decades. So how would you characterize the evolution of the Institute from the 60s to the 70s and to the recent decades? Well, uh, yeah, when it started, of course, it was an elitist institution because very, students were chosen uh, very carefully, of course, through the entrance exam. The numbers were much smaller. The choice was, of course, even difficult at that time and sometimes heartbreaking, you know, one mark only and somebody makes it or somebody doesn't. But the numbers are much smaller. Then the classroom situation was much better. You had much smaller class. You, I had maybe to start with 40, 45 students in my class. Today, the situation is very different. The numbers that aspire is much large. The numbers that come in is much large. The numbers that you have in your class is much large. Facilities are there, internet is there, and so on and so forth. But the ways of learning, the attitude of students, the expectations of teachers, they have not changed much. And so we have everything, but uh, we don't have uh, 
full satisfaction people do badly in courses they have to drop a course they have to they fail a course there is backlog and things like that which in theory i thought should not happen in an iit at all you came in with such careful selection hopefully we have been doing a good job if you have also been doing a good job there should not be a situation where a student fails a course uh, or even does badly i know i would be happy if i if i can give an a double a to everybody because everybody is doing well i'm not expecting uh, too much from every student uh, so i'm not saying the sky is the limit so you must know everything very well and so on but still why this is happening partly i think because of these numbers and uh, it's true that we cannot be elitist but today the view has also changed why do you want to get it, get into an iit not because you are going to get a better education than elsewhere but because with an iit degree you have a better prospect of your future life whether it is getting admission elsewhere or whether it is getting a job and things like that somehow people believe that with an iit stamp you will get a better job or you will get a better admission subsequently not because you value the iit education on its own that here i am getting education which is not an ordinary one which is for me for my own benefit as a person not to help me in my career later on it will but that's not the goal of it so i make the best use of it while i am here that is not unfortunately happening the time that the students are spending they are not uh, bringing their full uh, power to the course it was not happening in the old times also even in the 70s or even in the 60s there were students who would fail for other reasons there would be attractions cultural problems and things like that uh, so you would have backlog students even at that time but the numbers were small and the students i think were a little excited so to speak about being in iit today the situation is not that uh, way i don't know whether how many children are really excited to be in an iit and to be able to go through four years of uh, interaction with faculty environment and so on and not worry about grades and subsequent job and where i will apply and things like that just the excitement of being in a place the excitement of learning putting your effort and getting uh, the results uh, thereof that has uh, diminished i think uh, i don't know how one can uh, what one can do about it and uh, change things uh, it's not to say that some so, such and such thing is out of fault all the things are there together we can't suddenly say that reduce the numbers drastically we can't suddenly tell students that look don't worry about your prospects uh, in future because your parent uh, gets wants you to get into iit bombay computer science because that's the topmost institute so to speak so that your chances later on are much better if your parents are expecting that and they have spent a lot of money sending you to some coaching class to get into the iit then they are justified in a way and so you are uh, under that burden that uh, maybe you didn't like computer science you didn't want to get into computer science you would have liked something else or you would have liked to go not into iit but somewhere else but you are here now you spend your four years and get out of it with some good grades and appropriate batch or set of courses so that you have a better job prospect eventually so this can this is happening or this has uh, been happening but that's the way it is uh, so so has the excitement of the student uh, community kind of diminished in recent decades sir if i understand you correctly i i i get the feeling i am not teaching now for the last 5 uh, or 6 years and btex uh, i have not taught them also uh, but the first year uh, student what is the uh, excitement i i do hope and i do wish that we paid some attention to that that is after we got the students although it is a difficult job with say 1500 students what can you do about it can you spend some time with them to find out uh, what is their motivation what is their level of uh, commitment what is their level of excitement if you could measure it if there is an instrument it could have been very nice 
the student just puts the finger into that instrument and you find out that the student's level of excitement is 90%, whereas somebody else is 60%. So it takes a, a long time to find out. And the numbers are such that we just don't, we are not able to do it. But I believe maybe we should do it to assess the excitement, the motivation of students in the first year and then do something about it. Uh, improve it or if not, tell them that, okay, leave this program at the end of the first year, not because you will not do well, but because you don't feel like doing it, you know. So do something which you like better, you know, go to some arts or some commerce or whatever, it doesn't matter. And we have provision now that students can leave the program uh, with some partial credit. Uh, so something like in not quite, but say after two years, you may get some BSc degree or something. Is it possible? There have been thinking about that kind, especially at the graduate level. You are admitted into the PhD program, but you are not doing well. So can you get some benefit out of what your time you have spent and the money and time that the institute has spent? There are some provisions. But people think it's a you know, stigma that I joined IIT and then I left after one year. Instead of a stigma, it should be that, look, I found out at the end of first year that this is what I like and this is what I don't like. And I don't fit here and I do fit here and I go ahead and do it. I think we have to overcome those uh, feelings. And uh, or even if I left, uh, left after two years, those two years were not wasted, hopefully. Hopefully I learned something, I did something. Even if I picked up some cultural uh, experiences, even that is worth it. So it is not that it is a waste of time. You have your full life ahead of you. And that is, by the way, something I would like to say uh, at this moment, that why should our education stop at the bachelor's, master's or PhD level? Why should it not continue? Not even only at the personal level, but even at a uh, collective level. Why can't many people get together and do some reading in astronomy, for example, which they have, they have very little. But the internet does provide a possibility, but that's not happening. In the city of Mumbai, with 1 lakh, 20, 000, uh, 20 lakh, uh, sorry, 1 crore, 120 lakh of people, and young people, maybe 10 lakh or even 10,000, can I not find 100 or 10 people, uh, students? who have finished their uh, education, they're doing a job and they're busy, but they can spare some time on getting to know a little bit more what they had missed out. Some programs are doing well, like the TFR program, uh, uh, Chai, uh, Science with Chai or... Uh, chai and Why. Chai and Why, but they are considering only questions that the students raise or parents raise or whatever, whosoever raises, and some answers to be given. Not pursuing something with a dedication or with some continuity for say one month or six months. We can't pick it up in a hurry. Can one in one year pick up a little bit of astronomy, which, is, which will equip me better to make me rethink about my views on astrology or my uh, relatives or friends views on astrology, I can argue with them. I can tell them, look, 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 uh, they, they don't worry about the Munger and the Saturn and blah, blah. Okay. This is where it all comes about anyway. So, for example, sky watching, it's not enough to just go one evening and sit and look through the telescope and be impressed. That's not enough. The astronomy that our forefathers learned involved looking at the sky every night, night after night, year after year. If you're not able to spend that time, but over a period of one year, maybe at least some 10 nights of sky watching, if you're able to do around the year, okay? There's quite a bit of astronomy, astounding astronomy that you will be forced to learn. Where are, what are the planets in my visual experience? Have you, let me put it bluntly, ever looked at a planet in the near past, or have I for that matter? No. Well, a planet which is visible is, a, is Venus, 
But how many of us will notice Venus in the evening sky or in the morning sky? Okay. Maybe Jupiter is another planet which could be noticed because it's bright enough to be noticed. Or maybe Saturn or maybe Mars. Forget about Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, and Mercury. Okay. They are too small to be noticed. Or the moon for that matter. Have you seen the moon in the recent past? Have you looked at moonrise or moonset, moon in the eastern sky, moon in the western sky? Have you noticed that just as you can see the crescent moon in the western sky at the time of sunset or after sunset, you can see the crescent moon in the eastern sky before sunrise? I didn't know it either till accidentally I saw it and I was surprised that you see the crescent moon in the eastern sky before sunrise. Now when you do that, then you realize the, there's something, the relationship between the positions of sun, moon, and the earth, their relative positions and their hypothesis about it, sun in the center, earth, moon, or earth in the center, sun, moon, you can then start thinking about it. And then say, okay, the present hypothesis that the sun is in the center, the earth goes around the sun, and the moon goes around the uh, earth in this particular way, explains this phenomenon fairly satisfactorily. Not enough to be told that this is so, that the sun, uh, moon, earth goes around the uh, uh, sun and the moon goes around the earth. I find out through my experience that there is something puzzling about it, that it needs to be figured out, that it can be figured out. But you will need to observe, not once, month after month or maybe if you want to observe the moon several times a month you have to observe the moon before you do that there is something fishy about it okay so and then you pick up a lot of trigonometry as a result because the model building requires you to build up your concept of angle and measuring angles and things like that and trigonometry came out of that not just out of some sine theta, cos theta, and some tables and some formula that you have to remember and commit to memory and then use it. Okay. But we don't spend the time. So I'm surprised. I have tried, made an attempt, but I don't really know how to go about it. That in the city of Mumbai, if I can find 10 people who are able to give a commitment that over a period of one year, we will spread over that year, we will spend some time on astronomy together where we leave aside all our preconceptions and go back to the fundas and try to learn something. Maybe help by what somebody knows. One of us knows something more than the other and things like that. Not that you forget everything and you discover everything on your own, but at least have that astronomical experience. Then you are able to talk a little bit with confidence about astronomy, astrology, why astrology is good or bad, why astronomy should be studied or not studied and things like that. So with so many people around and they have a lot of free time, I suppose, everybody is busy, but then on their end, everybody has free time. You have YouTube videos to watch, you have other, uh, webinars and this, that and the other. Take genetics, the genetical uh, back, basic material, DNA, RNA. What is the background material? Can one spend one year or a period of one year, maybe one hour every month or one hour every week, looking at some of this background material and then trying to think about it along with the pioneers and bring it up on your own so that I know a little better now what it is and not simply words like DNA, RNA and then recombination and you know what this, that and the other and then genetics and genome. And of course, we are able to do things and so on and so forth. It's good to know about it. It's good to be smart about it. But is that all? Given our time, given our uh, facilities, the internet, the world is your uh, you know, uh, place for learning. How or can we learn a few things well together? And if you remember in my uh, Disturbing You uh, video, uh, yes, I remember that. Yeah, uh, so I would urge uh, viewers of this talk to look at disturbing you and Agashe and see what it is. A simple thing that we just don't even think about it that if I have a group of people or a group of objects on my table and I count, then I count them out, 
I get a certain number, say 10, and then I'm asked to recount, and then I get the same number 10. Why should it be so? Because when I count, I count them perhaps in a different order. The, fir the first apple that I pick is not the one that I picked in my first counting. If that is so, why? I get the same answer at the end. Think about it. Now, there's no need to go to mathematics and induction and, you know, natural number system and, you know, embed uh, this into that because it has nothing to do with that. It has something to do with what we do when we count. So what do we do when we count? We have not paid attention to that. As a result, you're not able to make any progress to answer the question, why do I get the same number? Okay. We have not paid attention to why we count, how we count, what we count. And as a result, uh, we are not able to answer that question. But is that something which is simple? The answer is not because they have the same number, because there is the same number of apples on the table. That's only saying that no matter how I count, I get the same number. But I'm asking, why should I get the same number? Is it in the nature of apples, or is it in the nature of counting, or is it by uh, God's grace that we get the same number, or oh, why? Can we think about it? So that's the kind of uh, thing. So recently I started a blog, but I have not really put a lot of material on the blog, which is uh, titled Re-Educating Myself. So those who like to visit blogs can visit my blog, Re-Educating Myself. And there I have some four uh, episodes so far, or four write-ups on some of these uh, school uh, math or school science issues. Uh, the idea is to see whether we can collect a few people who can do some rethinking about it together. And I don't like this model where I know and then I pass it on. That's not the idea. And that's why I have not come up with a textbook. I know everything and now you know, learn from me. No. How do I know? <laughs> what do I know? How do I know? What do I know? Find out from me and let's find out together. Let's learn together if we could. There is no apparently apparently time or scope for it. I think there is time and scope. Let's hope it is done not by me, by somebody else. It doesn't matter. But if there are groups which are learning together some of these basic things, not advanced. I'm not say, saying learn about cosmology. Do it if you can. But if you are learning about cosmology without your basics in astronomy, uh, without sound basics in astronomy, then I think there is a bit of a problem there. So whether it's possible, let's, we don't know. Let's see. There's one question about your sons, Amod and Kaustab. They have been completely legendary and part of the campus folklore, you know, for their accomplishments. Since a lot of IIT Bombay alumni would be watching this video, could you please tell us about Amod and Kaustab and, and how they are and what they've been doing after campus? All right, I hope my sons don't object to my uh, talking about them. But anyway, I'll uh, talk uh, not much, but relevant uh, stuff. So uh, why did they get into IIT? Did I or did we or did people force them? Not at all. But of course, we lived on the IIT campus. And like anybody at that time, IIT was the institution to get into whatever. OK, so they quite naturally thought about it. And they put in a lot of effort. They were good already as uh, 11th and 12th or uh, college students. They worked hard on it. They got into it. They also got into a subject that they liked at that time. Both of them got into electrical engineering. OK, again, a coveted subject at that time, way back in the uh, late 80s or uh, at that time. CSC was not at the top. Double E, IIT Bombay was at the top. OK, so they got in. Did I tell them? No. They got in uh, because they thought about it and they liked it and they got in. Then, of course, they did well and they wanted to continue their education. So they could have stopped it. Did I force them? No. They thought that they have to study more. But they decided to quit doubly. Not because I told them, but because by that time they came to know better uh, what they liked or what they would uh, like to do. So Amod chose, uh, of course, he was not very clear at that time. So he continued doubly for some time. Subsequently, he switched over to computer science and then finally switched to mathematics. 
and he became a full fledged mathematician which is what he is today he teaches at the florida state university at tallahassee and he is in uh, algebraic geometry number theory uh, which is in a way as abstract as can be so he switched from electrical engineering to mathematics and has stayed on there kostob after his graduation decided that he was going in for physics anyway and so he switched to physics subsequently graduated got his phd and now he is a faculty of the department of physics at uh, university of maryland at college park and he is working in the phenomenological uh, theories and high energy physics and theoretical physics to put it uh, very uh, bluntly and he is happy about it so th this is the way uh, their education went uh, i at no stage we had to force them of course we had to make sure that at home we did not have distractions fortunately at that time there was no uh, tv so not much of it anyway so we could keep them um, uh, away from distraction and in the iit also there were not too many distractions but in the iit they were pretty good in sports both of them did very well in sports they were interested in culture so it's not that they were only bookworms or you know uh, uh, whatever you call them at that time uh, so they enjoyed the uh, hostel culture they had very good uh, friends the connections have remained and so on but on their own they chose to do what they wanted to do so there's very little uh, we contributed in a way to their education except have the uh, proper atmosphere perhaps you know at home and give the encouragement that was needed does that uh, is that adequate i guess so sir it has been a great honor and pleasure to be speaking to you sir i now also speak on behalf of my classmates from the 1992 btech batch that you taught we are extremely grateful to you sir for teaching and motivating and influencing us at a very crucial stage of our lives so this is a great opportunity for me to express sincere thanks to you sir on behalf of my entire batch thanks a lot sir yeah can i add a sentence Please. all you guys who have gone through the iit bombay and who have had the uh, fortune or misfortune of taking a course with me if you are around mumbai do get in touch with me as soon as possible but if you are around in india or even abroad i would be very glad to uh, know more about you and get you involved in this uh, experiment of uh, learning together something which did we did to some extent when you were here in iit but which you might be able to continue now that you are, you are out of the iit so let's see what happens i would be very happy to see you so all the best to all of you thank you vivek in particular for hosting this uh, session so thank you very much sir it's been really great to uh, talk to you and the talk has been extremely nostalgic for me as well because it br brings back memories of my uh, btech days at uh, iit bombay and uh, thank you very much sir and i'll put a link to your blog in the description of this video so that the viewers of this video would be able to reach your blog sir thank you thank you so thank you very much sir